All right, everyone, we can we are ready to start. I hope everybody can see me, can hear me. My name is Leonardo Souza. I'm assistant teaching professor at Silicon on Carnegie Mellon at Silicon Valley campus. And today I'll be the chair of this session. So the name of the session, Software Testing 5. We have six papers to go through, six presenters. So the idea of the presentation will be five minutes for every presenter. And at the end, the remaining 30 minutes of the session, we're gonna have our open discussion with all the presenters and everybody else here in the room as well. So in case you guys have questions, you can post it on the chat. Uh, would it be nice if you can put the name of the person to who you are targeting the, the question? So this way it will be easier for us to monitor. Additionally, when you started the round of the presentations, I will also post on the chat when you have, when you reach the four minutes mark, because as I mentioned before, each presenter has only five minutes. So in the final one minute for your presentation, I will post a message on chat. Just a heads up so you can wrap it up your presentation. Okay, so any questions? So we can start with the first uh, paper, demystifying the challenges and benefit of analyzing news report logs and bug reports. And Ron, you, will, you have the floor it's with you now. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Uh, okay, I may just start. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, this paper is really about software testing, but uh, let me uh, uh, talk about it. Okay, so hi everyone, my name is Aaron Chen. Um, today I will be presenting our paper, Demystifying the Challenges and Benefits of Analyzing User Reported Log and Bug Reports. So this is a joint work with Dr. Peter Chen and Dr. Xiaowei Wan. There are many research work on the study of software log, for example, studying software practices or leveraging log in debugging. However, one problem is that the availability of log is limited due to privacy and technical concerns. Fortunately for researchers, we also find the user reported log in back reports. There are this log that user reported in back report to help developers better investigate the problem. However, there are still challenges in leveraging those logs. Those logs can be incomplete or irrelevant. Which lead to a question like this, how often do we find log in bug reports? What characteristics do they have? Do they help to resolve bugs? Can they provide information on the location of the bugs? Those are the questions that we try to answer in this paper. And we'll show that the user reported log, despite being incomplete, contain valuable information. We conduct a case study on 10 open source Java system. Um, we collected over 8,800 bug reports, identifying log snippets and stack traces. From this data, we first invest, investigate whether there's a difference in bug resolution time. We find that bug report with log take more time to resolve. There are two possible factors that influence the resolution time. First, the initial attached log might not be enough for debugging. So developers might ask for more log in the comment section of the bug reports, which delay the overall bug fixing process. Second, the bug fixes of those with log are more complex, so it takes more time to resolve. Then we study the usefulness of those log by comparing the overlaps between the log class, classes, the classes that we find directly inside the log, and fix classes, classes that were modified to fix the bug. We found that a majority of bug report with log contain direct overlaps with the bug fixing. We also report a log provide a good indication of where the bug might be located on average uh, we find that the local classes can locate 44% of the fixed classes. Those findings lead to our third research question. Why do some fixed classes have no overlaps with the low classes? We uncovered two reasons, and based on this, there are some implications that we'd like to share. First, uh, log might, be, might show the point of failure, but not the root cause of the fault. In this example, we can see the fault does not appear directly on the log, 
but rather on the execution between two log lines. Motivated by this example, we further uncovered the execution path between log lines. We found that based on the no overlapping bug report, 28% of them have fixed classes reachable by execution path. Therefore, we suggest that future research to consider using execution path reconstructed from log to provide additional debugging supports for developers. Another reason why there's no overlap is because of code evolution. We find that sometimes the source code that generates the, the logs no longer exists. In such cases, developers have additional challenges in understanding and fixing the bug. We encourage future study to utilize prior version of the source code to help developers analyzing bug reports. And that concludes our talk. We invite you all to read our paper. We made the data available online. We also published an extension to this paper on bug localization. We hope you enjoyed the talk and thank you very much for your time. All right, so we can move to the second paper, Reinforcement Learning for Test Case Prioritization. Kahani? All right, feel free to start. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Nafisa Kahani, and uh, today I'm going to give a brief summary of our paper, um, Reinforcement Learning for Test Case Prioritization, that was co-authored with uh, Mushtaba Wagerzadeh, Lionel Bryant, and me. So, uh, uh, as you might know, uh, using continuous integration has uh, many benefits, but it also creates some challenges, especially when it comes to regression testing. Uh, in fact, because of the uh, CI's dynamic environment and time constraints, uh, regression testing in CI uh, becomes so uh, it means that uh, specific uh, techniques must be uh, designed to deal with the dynamic nature and timing constraints of CI. Uh, so uh, in general, uh, regression testing uh, can be done by running all the uh, previously defined test cases to make sure that new changes to the system don't uh, break existing uh, functionality of the system. Uh, but this approach is very time consuming and expensive, um, especially for very large systems. So uh, test case selection and prioritization are two methods that can be used to solve this issue. Uh, test case uh, prioritization is used for finding the optimal uh, order for test case executions in um, order to detect faults as soon as possible, uh, where we uh, give high priority to test cases that are likely to fail and also have a shorter execution time. So um, there are some uh, ways to apply test case prioritization uh, to CI, such as static and dynamic analysis, heuristics, and machine learning. Our work is focused on machine learning techniques, especially specifically uh, reinforcement learning or RL techniques. So let's see the motivation for using RL in our work. Um, RL has uh, recently been applied to challenging scenarios which uh, require um, continuous adoption, similar to what we have for uh, test case prioritization in the CI context. Um, also, we have uh, many advanced RL uh, algorithms uh, proposed over the uh, last few years that can increase um, the accuracy of our work. So in our, we um, consider the test case prioritization and and then we uh, model the um, sequential interactions between the CI environment and the test case uh, prioritization agent as an RL problem uh, using a ranking models, including uh, listwise, uh, pairwise, and uh, pointwise. 
So uh, for a list wise, uh, we use a list of uh, test cases as um, as the estate and um, just want to show you. Um, and uh, then the RL agent uh, returns uh, the rank of all test cases as a vector of uh, discrete values. Uh, then we, as you can see here, the reward, we calculate, calculated the reward based on the uh, differences between the assigned uh, ranks and the optimal rank. So if the distance is smaller, the, it means that the reward is higher. In a pairwise ranking, an agent is provided with a pair of these cases, and then the reward was calculated based on the uh, uh, based on the optimal ranking for uh, test cases with different uh, verdicts. Uh, verdicts assigning a lower rank to a failed test case results in the highest reward. Otherwise, assigning a lower rank to a test case with shorter execution time results in a, a, a smart reward. And in point-wise ranking, uh, at each step, we consider only one test case as a state. And uh, then the agent uh, returns a real number that uh, um, corresponds to the ranks of the test case. And as you can see here, uh, the reward was also calculated based on the uh, difference between the uh, normalized optimal ranking and the assigned uh, rank. So uh, to evaluate the algorithms, uh, we use 10 RL uh, algorithms that are provided by a stable baseline uh, framework. And uh, we ran extensive uh, experiments on two categories of uh, data sets, including the simple history uh, data and also the enriched history uh, data that both of these uh, data sets are publicly uh, available. And uh, regarding the results in terms of uh, accuracy uh, per pairwise uh, performs better than uh, pointwise and uh, listwise. And in terms of uh, training time, uh, listwise uh, performs uh, worse than pointwise and uh, pointwise and pairwise. Uh, we oh, also- All right, can see? Sorry, uh, we... okay, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. We also examine how the best configuration of RL performs compared to the state-of-the-art ranking models. And the MARC uh, had the best results among ML-based solutions. Also, our best configuration significantly improves ranking accuracy over that of uh, MARC. Thank you. All right, thank you. Are the authors of the third paper here surveying the developer experience of flaky tests? Is any of the authors here? All uh, right, I don't think so. So let's move to the next paper. The impact of flaky, flaky tests on historical test prioritization on Chrome. Kahani, can you stop sharing the screen and let Emad share his screen? Perfect. Okay. Go ahead. Hello everybody, my name is uh, Emad and I will present you with the impact of flaky test on historical test prioritization on Chrome, the work I did with my uh, supervisor, Dr. Ricky. So uh, we wanted to understand uh, how uh, test prioritization algorithms perform on large scale projects and in the presence of uh, flakiness. So for the, that purpose, we examined 276 million test runs on uh, Chrome. We captured all of the uh, test results from the Chrome website, and we re-examined prior historical uh, test prioritization algorithms like Kim and Porter and Elbom algorithms. We published the uh, replication package and data in the following link. Uh, I guess the data is so valuable because uh, it's one of the rare data sets consisting of uh, the test results uh, from one of the largest scale data sets with uh, flaky flags. 
So the, ga uh, the gap in the previous studies uh, was that uh, only a few studies uh, considered flaky failures. Elbow Metal didn't differentiate flaky tests on uh, Google data set. Uh, Peng et al. studied flaky tests on a tiny data set with only 252 Travis CI jobs. Uh, the other problem is that uh, flaky test might be exaggerated uh, by the previous works. Uh, for example, Ashamari et al. run each test thousand times and found 67% of tests as flaky. But in Chrome, uh, we see that only they rerun a failure three to 10 times and only 0.03% uh, of tests are flaky. The reason for that uh, huge difference between the percentage of failure, uh, flaky failures uh, is the way they try to identify uh, failures. If you, run, if you rerun a test for thousands of times, uh, you will finally break the test. And uh, that is not the way they identify flaky tests in the industry. They only rerun a test uh, if it is a failure and they only rerun it for uh, three to 10 times or a couple of times. We have to emphasize that flaky tests on Chrome do not stop the build. You can see in this builder uh, that we have 195 flaky tests, but the final result is uh, succeeded. So flaky uh, tests do not stop a build, uh, a build from being integrated. So tests that fail in the past will fail in the future. That's the idea behind the, most of the history-based uh, test prioritization algorithms like Kim and Porter and Elbom. Uh, if we consider uh, flaky failures as true failures like the previous studies, uh, this is the result of uh, these algorithms on the Chrome, uh, Chrome data set. Uh, the distribution of the gain hours uh, is not even. But uh, you can see that uh, actually 25% of uh, failures are delayed, but the median for Kim and Porter is more than 2.5 hours of gain, and for uh, Elbum is uh, more than five hours. But then uh, we consider the fact that flaky tests do not stop the build from being integrated, and actually we only consider true failures. Uh, we can see that the results uh, are deteriorated significantly the median for Elbum goes to zero and the median for Kim and Porter goes to half an hour. So we go a step further to see what's the reason behind this uh, poor result. And we see that out of 100,000 failures, we have 99.58% uh, of failures as flaky failures. So the majority of failures are uh, flaky failures. And we also wanted to see that how repetitive these failures are so that uh, this diagram shows that uh, sh shows that how uh, failures are concentrated on the uh, failing test. And you can see that uh, for the flaky failures, uh, only 20% of tests are responsible for 90% of flaky uh, failures. And it means that uh, only a, a minority of uh, flaky tests are responsible for the majority of flaky failures. And so they are so uh, repetitive. But uh, true failures are more evenly distributed. So in conclusion, for history-based test prioritization algorithms, we can say that uh, these kind of algorithms do not work when there are a uh, few repetitive failures. But the problem is repetitiveness is the nature of flaky failures, but not true failures. And that's the reason why they perform poorly when only true failures are considered. So uh, thank you for joining me. I will be happy to answer your questions. And uh, you can also reach us uh, by the following emails. All right, thank you. So the next paper, the Missify the Depends Challenge in kind of fuzzing. You have. Do I still unmute? You are still muted, you how? Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Could you hear me now? No worries. Yes, Okay. go ahead. Uh, I'm Yu Hao from University of California, uh, Riverside. And uh, today I will present our paper, demystifying the Dependency Challenge in Kernel Fuzzing. Okay. Sorry. Uh, 
first, I will introduce some background and the motivation of this paper. Uh, Linux kernel is widely used in servers and uh, cell phones, and uh, finding has become one of the most popular and essential method for uncovering bugs and vulnerabilities. This color, which is the state of the art kernel father, has found out fixed more than 4,700 bugs in the Linux kernel. But uh, uh, then I will introduce how this color works. First, this color generates uh, templates from Linux uh, kernel by human. The templates, which is the knowledge about the syscalls, system calls, includes the name of syscall and the argument of syscalls and the dependency between them. This color could generate valid test cases from those templates and execute them in the Linux kernel. Then this color pick interesting test cases by new coverage. From those interesting test cases, this color would uh, mutate them based on the template to get more test cases. So by this way, this color could uh, uh, find so much bugs. But uh, uh, so, so we, we know that uh, we have efficient uh, finding algorithm in this color. We have a sufficient uh, long finding time. And there are also comprehensive template for, the, for some kernel modules. But however, all those all of them could only achieve a coverage of 48% of the, those kernel modules. So what else prevents this color to get more coverage? So the answer is dependency challenge. So this paper want to figure out the root causes behind the dependent challenge in the kernel finding. Then I will introduce a, a example case. Look at this example. The condition at line one has one uncovered uh, branch, so it's belong to uh, we call it unresolved dependency. Since it's read value from some global memory, which is a field CDD underscore mustard in CDI here, so it's also belong to unresolved dependency. And then the code at line six white value to the field CDD CDI a underscore method in CDI. So it's a white statement for the unresolved dependency at line one because they write to the same global memories. Because it can also change the global memory to an impacted value, it's also the effective white statement for the unresolved dependency at line one, which means if we satisfy this condition, we can cover the uncover code at line three, resolve the condition at line one. So, and the way we call the, uh, we define the dependency is the relationship between the unresolved dependency and its effective white statement. Notice they could in different uh, syscalls or even not in syscall at all. So, uh, then I will introduce our final uh, root cause because of the time. Uh, after uh, we pick four different uh, types of kernel module and uh, we uh, we we have uh, run a long fuzzing on them and some sample more than 100 unresolved dependency. And uh, we, we also have a lot of code and uh, a lot of human works. Finally, we find the five root causes of those uh, dependency challenge. The biggest root cause is, uh, is surprisingly is uh, dead code. Because uh, those dead code are related to some global memory and they need uh, inter-procedure analysis to recognize them. So, which may be the reason that they cannot be recognized by current solution. Uh, so, there is no way to cover the to cover those code uh, for the kernel finding. The second one is the environment dependency. The environment uh, for Linux kernel is mainly the input from hardware. So, it needs some specific uh, input from hardware to resolve the dependency in order to co cover related code. The next one is incomplete template. Although we have already picked the kernel module with comprehensive template, we still find that some unresolved dependency are because of bugs in templates. So we need some techniques to automate uh, generate uh, templates instead of human. And uh, in fact, I'm working on this now. And uh, another interesting root cause is the unobserved uh, dependency. Uh, in fact, besides the syscalls, there are some other function, as there are some functions can be triggered by other interface of the Linux kernel. For example, the bottom half position, uh, module init and the module exit functions, and the callback functions interrupt. So the kernel body needs to consider all of those different interface and combine them together in order to have a better coverage. Uh, so yeah, that's all. All right, thank you.
Now, the last paper in the session, Build Sheriff, Change Our Ad Test Failure, Triage for Continuous Integration Builds. Chain? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Oh, okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Chen Zhang, come from Funan University. The paper I reported is Build Sheriff, Change Aware Test Fidi Triad for Continuous Integration Build. Uh, first, let me explain what is CR, that is Continuous Integration. CR development practice that requires people to frequently compile static analyze test and integrate integrate code changes. CR has been widely used because it can automate the build process, detect errors earlier, and reduce risks in software development. Uh, why we do this research? Uh, CR builds often break, and uh, test failures are one of the most common reasons for broken building in CR. Uh, according to a recent study, CR are responsible for 59% of broken builds in open source CR projects. Uh, developers need to manually localize and uh, repair the underlying faults. However, it's not easy for them to analyze test failures in a build because a build is not always triggered for every commit and a build may change multiple source code fails. In that sense, it's expensive to diagnose all test failures in a build. Techniques uh, are designed to cluster uh, test failures that are caused by the same fault into the same cluster. Uh, in this way, test failure diagnosis can be realized by only analyzing one test failure in each cluster, but all, not all the test failures, uh, which can reduce manually manual diagnosis cost. Uh, test failure can be split into two types. Uh, if a test throws an exception when running, we call it an exception failure. If the actual outcome of the test uh, differs from its oracle, we call it a learn failure. Uh, here is an example of exception failure. This time through an IO exception. Uh, this, uh, this is an example of a learn failure. The actual uh, message of the test differs from the expecting message. Uh, in this paper, uh, present a large scale empirical study to understand test failure in a CI build and found that uh, both exception and the failures are common to cause test failure builds. Therefore, test failure charge in CI should suppose both both of them. Uh, multiple test failures are common in CI builds, which which represents the potential reduction of test failure diagnosis uh, cost that can be achieved by test failure charge. And test failure in a large part of the type build have only one root cause. Thus, uh, test failure charge in CI should be aware of this specific characteristic. <clears throat> then we propose a new change aware approach build sheriff to charge test failures for CI build so that test failures with the same root cause are put in the same cluster. Uh, it works in three steps uh, child knowledge preparation, exception failure charge, and the uh, it first prepare um, child knowledge by analyzing the build log, the project source code, and the code changes from the previous uh, past build. Uh, based on the child knowledge, uh, it then use different strategies to child the exception failures and assertion failures. Uh, we develop a pipeline of three strategies based on complexity of code changes, change aware statues similarity, and the uh, Exception message similarity for uh, exception failure charge. And the uh, pipeline of two strategies based on complexity of code changes and the uh, change aware test code similarity for exception failure charge. Uh, in the experiment, uh, we did for this question to evaluate the effectiveness and the efficiency of build sheriff. <coughs> in summary, uh, our paper makes the following contributions. I conducted a large scale empirical study to characterize test failures in real world Java projects and uh, motivate test failure triage. 
uh, we propose a new general approach build a shelf to charge side fitted in their builds uh, effectively and uh, practically. And uh, we conducted an experiment on 200 broken builds to demonstrate the uh, effectiveness and the efficiency of build a shelf. Uh, that's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. So now we can move to the next step, the next uh, phase of this. You're going to have some discussions regarding the different papers that we're presenting today. So you can either unmute yourself and ask the questions to the presenters, or you can post your question on the chat. There is a question option, so you can write your question over there. Remember to put the name of the person to who you want to ask the question. Who wants to start? Uh, I have a question for the last paper. In fact, I'm not familiar with the continual uh, integration, the workflow of that. So I wonder uh, the person who pushed the code uh, would directly get a, a build failure. So why the person do not directly fix the bugs or fix the, the, the failures or something? Okay. Did you understand uh, the question? Oh, uh, sorry. You mean the developer doesn't uh, fix the bug? I mean, you might imagine. I think the workflow should be someone push the code, and uh, then there is a, a automated uh, system, the CI system, could directly build the code and to directly find that okay, your code caused some new failures or, or something. So the the, uh, yeah. the person who push the code should. Uh, Directly fix the bugs or fix something. Uh, yes, that's right. <coughs> uh, the aim of our paper is just uh, uh, charge test failures in different uh, class, cluster based on their root cause. Uh, you know that uh, <coughs> yeah, each test failure build may contain many. Uh, test the failures and uh, it uh, it uh, it is time time con it is expensive to manually diagnose the test failures of uh, all the test failures. Uh, we just uh, want to charge this test failure. Then the developer can just uh, analyzing one test failure cluster uh, and uh, reduce their Diagnosis cost. So you mean the bug may not in the code who of the person who just pushed? It's maybe in somewhere else. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh the the CI builder can also be triggered by a pull request, and uh, uh, when the builder is triggered on a progress and the CI system will make a uh, merge. That means uh, the conflict of the main branch and the, your code can also cause the failure. Okay, thanks. All right, more questions, everyone? Okay, so let me do. A, let me ask a question to you, Hao. Actually, so in, in your study, you how you found some of the root causes for the unsolved dependency, right? So, for example, you you gave an example that code as a root cause. Do you know all the root causes that only occur in the context of kind of fuzzing? Uh, in fact, we believe that for those complex software which uh, Complex stateful software should also meet those uh, questions. For example, some lib or some other uh, similar stateful software. So, but however, we our uh, research only focus on the Linux kernel. So we, we don't mm -hmm. say uh, they, the, those root cause must exist in others, but uh, it should be. And uh, also, we can know that. Uh, the most part of the kernel are drivers. And in fact, the drivers are somehow independent. So 
those root causes should also exist in in most drivers. So which is mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I see. I see. That makes sense. Uh, this idea of the pins challenge also can happen in any domain. In what? The, depend the dependency challenge. You mentioned about the dependency challenge as part of your study. What motivates your study, correct? Yeah. So this dependency challenge can happen in any context, not only in a Linux kernel. Right. And the uh, stateful software, I think, which means there are some inter state in the software we need to satisfy those state. So any kind of those software should have those uh, root causes because they are so okay. complex. Mm, I see, I see. All right, thank you. I had All a right, more questions. I, yeah, I had a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the question for the test prioritization, the reinforcement learning. Um, I, I, in, in prioritization, I, I, there's, I've only mostly just looked at it just um, in this recent paper that we looked at with Chrome. Um, but in those benchmarks that are often used for prioritization, excuse my ignorance, like how, what is the Q size? Like, are, is there actually any changes waiting to be tested? Because we notice like in the Travis data set, like often there's nothing waiting to be tested. So like, I know it's really more theoretical, but I'm just curious, like the benchmarks that people are using, like, do we even need prioritization or can we just run the tests, right? Um, so does anyone know the answer to that? Kahani, maybe you know that. Uh, so, uh, yes, I agree uh, with you. And actually, in our uh, recent work, uh, we examined uh, this one. And uh, the title of our uh, paper is a Scalable and Accurate Test Case Prioritization in Continuous Integration uh, Context. And uh, we examined this one in, our, in, in that paper. So what what is the Q size? How many changes are waiting to be tested? So um, as far as I um, just let me think a little bit. Um, Sorry, if you don't know. Uh, that's fine. Yeah, just uh, um, most of the times uh, we uh, notice that uh, uh, the regression uh, test um, takes less than uh, five minutes. Uh, so in our uh, recent work, uh, we um, I mean that we prepare a um, data set including uh, 25 subjects that for those subjects we just included those ones that their regression uh, testing is uh, more than uh, five minutes and also we consider the, the rate of their uh, failing uh, builds so uh, we prepare a data set, as I said, that it's available, uh, it's publicly available. And for that, uh, we consider this uh, regression test, I mean, the times and also the, the fail, the rate of the failed builds. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I see five minutes like for like integration testing, like it's not that long, right? Like you look at like, like other bigger projects and then you're doing prioritization so you're changing the order of tests which you know is going to introduce flaky tests and all this other kind of stuff like I, I i just haven't seen a lot of adoption in industry and, and i'd be curious if people can point me towards prioritization adoption in industry i mean selection you have to do selection especially if you just have like a master branch but on like relatively small projects we have five minutes of testing it remains unclear to me
it's necessary. But anyways, <laughs> I'll let someone that We, we uh, consider all of these things in our uh, recent work. Uh, so because for this work, we rely on the existing work and there are uh, data sets and um, the, the features that they have used. So, but uh, as I mentioned in our uh, recent work, uh, we uh, try to uh, consider all of these things and actually we uh, provide a comprehensive set of features, including 150 features uh, along with, um, and our data set is uh, it's a very comprehensive one in terms of the, I mean, diversity for the projects and, uh, and uh, yeah, and also we consider the the number of bail bills and also a uh, regression testing uh, time. Oh, Kahani, uh, actually, I have a follow up question. So you have applied reinforcement learning. So which characteristics of the problem of prioritizing test cases is a suitable for reinforcement learning? So why not use another type of algorithm like clustering? Why reinforcement learning? That's um, because of the dynamic uh, uh, environment of CI. The R uh, uh, provides us with the feature of incremental learning. So it means that we don't know we don't need to reconstruct uh, new models from scratch. We just need to uh, train a model and then deploy the model, and then we can, uh, uh, I mean, the, collect the, the data and then use for retraining the our model without the need to reconstruct, reconstruct it from scratch. So that's the uh, the main motivation for using uh, RL in our work. I see. I see. That makes sense. All right. Thank you. More questions, everyone? Because you have 20 minutes. <laughs> so for the first paper on run, are you there? And run. Uh, in your paper, in your second research question, you found the classes that uh, covert user report log provide a good indication of where to find a bug, right? So you can use that information to detect a bug. Did you know? Did you find any pattern or any recurrent aspect that you can implement a strategy? to bug location using the logged classes? Yes, in fact, um, well, we had our, um, actually a bug localization paper um, that's called Puffy Idea, where we try to reconstruct you know, the execution path, right? So mm -hmm. the idea is that further away it is from the log, um, the less it is suspicious, and closer it is to the log, you know, to a fault, um, mm -hmm. to where, where you know the user reported log, then it is more suspicious. So this is the idea of Puffy idea that we have, uh, that we try to do a bug localization using inform information retrieval based approach, and we combine it with the execution path that we have, and uh, you know we try to have maximize the probability of finding the forty locations. Mm -hmm. So you are thinking about this strategy? Yeah, it it is definitely a strategy. The idea is okay. just really, it's very simple, right? We just want to reconstruct the path between the log lines and we just uncover whatever that's in between and we have more information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is not much cost associated with retrieving the path? Uh, the cost mainly, uh, is one time cost where we try to build the call graph, right? The way we analyze the ASD, we use the SageR parser to analyze that and try to have the uh, the whole call path, a uh, call graph, mm -hmm. which we can easily derive, uh, reuse to derive the execution path. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay. More questions, everyone? So we have a question for Chain on chat. Chain? Uh, yes, yes, our our tool now only support memory now, but uh, I don't think the view system, system is correct to our approach. Uh, for, uh, for example, uh, Gradle can also, can also use our tool. But uh, you know that um, Gradle is more flex flexible, and uh, uh, you you may need to spend more time to pass the build log of Gradle and uh, extract uh, the the related uh, information. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think uh, yeah, I think the build system is not correct to our uh, approach. The, uh, when uh, Chen, when you are evaluating the results and you have different types of uh, reasons to failure, did flakeness also appear in your results? Uh, you mean flake test? Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, in our evaluation evaluation uh, data set, uh, we didn't find a flaggy test. And uh, so uh, our design of approach doesn't uh, consider flaggy test. Uh, but uh, yes, if a uh, flaggy test uh, appeared, it will impact the effectiveness of our approach. For example, uh, if a flag test is charged into a cluster that uh, uh, has a different root cause uh, from Flagness and uh, it select uh, as uh, uh, the preventive test for manual inspector inspector inspection. And, mm -hmm. uh, the root cause of the cluster will not be fixed fixed. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I think uh, uh, before using our approach, uh, we can we can apply some apply some flag test detection techniques. Uh, that's all. Okay, that answered my question. Thank you. Imad, can I ask you a question? Since in this same idea of flaky test, you, you investigated the impact of flaky test using the Chrome project as a baseline, correct? So, do you find any results on the Chrome project that you believe can be generalized to other domains? Uh, actually, uh, what we were interesting uh, in this project, first of all, uh, it was very important to mention that, uh, and as uh, Dr. V uh, questioned the problem, uh, that the, the main point is that uh, test prioritization problem should be considered in the uh, large scale projects. Um, we, uh, we tried smaller projects like the Travis uh, CI projects, but the point is uh, when we, for example, we have uh, two builds in a day uh, and they only for uh, run for less than 30 minutes. So that's not uh, the case for the test prioritization or test optimization in general. Um, so we went through the uh, taking out all of these uh, test results from the Chrome project as a big, uh, as a, a representative of a large scale project. And we are also uh, trying to have uh, a batching algorithms to, to try to uh, consider batching algorithms as well, because uh, there are uh, lots of parallelism and uh, also uh, a huge number of tests and builds uh, running in this project. For example, we have uh, more than 100 million tests uh, in a day for uh, for Chrome. Uh, so first of all, uh, the main point uh, we have to emphasize that the, uh, the problem of test optimization uh, is the case for the larger scale projects. And then the other uh, uh, factor that uh, I have to emphasize is that uh, the way 
different projects identify flaky tests uh, is uh, so different from each other. For example, some of them uh, rerun a test thousand, uh, thousands of times. And if you uh, rerun a test uh, more than, uh, I don't know, uh, thousands of times, you, you will finally find a problem for that test. So that's not the way uh, in Chrome they identify uh, flaky mm. failures. They, um, they, they try to exonerate a test, uh, actually, uh, when, when uh, they, uh, they detect a failure, they rerun it uh, a couple of times. And if uh, it passes, then they say that it's flaky, let's, uh, let's go on. So uh, let's move on, actually. Uh, so uh, they, uh, they pass a test that, uh, th th they pass a test that uh, fail, and then uh, after a rerun, they, uh, they have a, a pass. So uh, that's the other problem that uh, we have to consider in, the, the, in terms of uh, identifying flaky failures. Uh, but the other uh, important factor in, uh, in our research was that uh, many uh, other studies, uh, bec because in the data sets, there, there's no, uh, there's no uh, flaky flags. Uh, for example, if you look at the Elbum's uh, data set or um, other Travis CI uh, data sets, there's no uh, flaky flags. So uh, many studies uh, try to identify flaky uh, tests and flaky flags by rerunning the test or um, identifying in some other uh, kind of approaches. Uh, but uh, when we uh, consider that uh, only true failures are the main cause of the breaking of wheel, and then uh, we uh, and and the the, the uh, true failures are uh, some kind of unexpected uh, unexpected failures, uh, and they are not repeated enough uh, in the time of the uh, a build. So uh, that's uh, that's very important. That uh, in our research shows that uh, these kind of history based test prioritization algorithms doesn't work when we only consider the true failures. Uh, because the majority of failures showed up as flaky failures, and most of the repetitiveness is uh, on the flaky tests, not the uh, true failures, or the, uh, or actually in Chrome they call it unexpected failures because uh, the, they are not kind of repeat, uh, repeating. So the fact that they are not repetitive, this lead to have a a, a misidentification. So what is the characteristic that make uh, the identification correct for these cases? Uh, sorry, can you repeat your question? So, so you mentioned that some some uh, test cases was marked incorrectly, right, in the Chrome? I uh, just no, want no, to no. understand. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, what, what I'm saying is that uh, in, in Chrome, uh, the data we captured uh, from Chrome uh, we have the flags from the Chrome testing infrastructures that shows mm -hmm. that the, 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 this test was flaky. So mm -hmm. uh, we were not trying to, uh, uh, trying to identify flaky tests ourselves. So we are using the, the same labels that, uh, that Chrome uh, identified uh, as flaky. So, uh, and uh, by, by uh, considering that kind of labels and that kind of data, uh, we see that the, the majority of uh, failures are flaky failures. And then um, when, when we are uh, considering only true failures, uh, which mm -hmm. are mostly uh, unexpected, uh, then the, the performance of the uh, history-based test prioritization algorithm detrimented uh, significantly. Oh, I got it. I got it now. OK. Uh... Very interesting. <laughs> so th there was not a, a, the expectation, right? So when you look to the results, uh, 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 actually, uh, uh, Chrome uh, the, the way uh, Chrome uh, identify the, the the result of a test uh, is also very complex. Uh, hmm. For example, in, in many of the previous studies, we have only a pass and fail. But uh, in Chrome, firstly, they have uh, some kind of expected uh, results. So they, uh, before running a test, they have some kind of expectations that, uh, so uh, 
For example, they might expect a test to fail on a particular platform. A test might fail uh, on um, Windows, but might pass on the uh, Linux because it was designed for running on Linux. So uh, first of all, they have an expectation. And then based on those expectations, the result of the pass, fail, and crash other, uh, and other things uh, define the, uh, fin their final outcome. They, they might uh, end up a test being failure, but it was expected and as, uh, as identified as a pass because of the, those expectations. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very complex uh, 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 identifying the outcomes and labeling. But uh, as I mentioned, we are using all of the labels and all of the data from the Chrome themselves. We are not uh, identifying those kind of labels or flaky tests ourselves. We are just using their data. And based on those uh, data and uh, data and data sets, uh, we, uh, we could uh, conclude very important results, uh, which, mm. which we mentioned last week. Yeah. Mm. All right, all right, very interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, more questions, everyone? No? Uh, all right, I think we are getting close to the end of the session. Thank you very much. I invite everyone to read the papers. They are very interesting, especially this one about the priorization of the test cases. So Blakeness has appeared like the third paper in this second paper in this session. And you look like a very hot topic at the moment. So if there is no more questions, thank you very much, everyone. And I see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Can you, do we need to stop recording? Yeah, we can stop recording right now, right? Yes. Yeah, I, okay. yeah that's it.